That's what a celebration should be. <laughs> well, we've got a few more testimonials, and this one comes from the godfather, Don Corleone. My uh, deepest respects are from a puppet master to another. Yes, Don Corleone writes in an Italian accent. <laughs> so uh, sorry that uh, Signor Morte gave you an offer you cannot refuse. May you enjoy many fine and big and cannellones in heaven. <laughs> and this from the Shiny Object Syndrome Support Group. <laughs> oh, God. To, to our valued member, Linda, we want to extend our most sincere squirrel, squirrel! <laughs> and from the illustrious Salvador Dali, Linda, anybody can die. What's so great about that? Until you've painted a melting clock slithering onto a fish carcass in the desert. Well, now you've done something that matters. <laughs> oh. And this special tribute from Marcel Marceau. <laughs> Many of you have already seen Mayor Corbett. He wasn't supposed to be here tonight, but he showed up anyway. <laughs> he was supposed to be in South Korea learning about HESCO barriers. <laughs> then he had an opportunity to learn about them firsthand. <laughs> so he stayed in town. Anticipating his absence tonight, he taped a testimonial to Linda in advance. And we're going to see the videotape anyway because we all know he's much better on tape than I. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Mayor Ron Corbett. Hi, I'm Ron Corbett, governor of Cedar Rapids. <laughs> This time. Mayor, Mayor, you said governor. No, I didn't. Are you sure? Well, that's interesting, but I don't remember saying that. Ron, we're all tired here. Come on, let's just uh, let's 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 get it this time. Okay, all right. All right, Mayor, testimonial, take 38. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ron Corbett, Mayor of Cedar Rapids, and it's my pleasure to do this film testimonial of Linda Langston. I'm sorry I can't be there today. I'm in Korea. I'm actually visiting one of our sister cities, Angdong, South Korea. It's interesting. Uh, their slogan is a city that smells like kimchi. And our city is a city that smells like crunch berries. It's interesting how two cities can come together. Talk about Linda, Mr. Mayor. Okay, all right. Linda, Linda Langston. Well, I met Linda Langston in 2002, thanks to Mother Nature. Yes, Mother Nature. The butterflies and turtles brought Linda and I together. She was running for county supervisor, and I was the head of the Chamber of Commerce. Our big project at the time was the completion of Highway 100. However, the county supervisors and the conservation board were against the project. Linda was in favor of it. So I came out and endorsed Linda as a county supervisor, even though she was a Democrat and I'm a Republican and the incumbent, Loomer Dostal, was a Republican. Linda won that race and I don't think Loomer ever forgave me of that. Well, yeah, anyway, Linda, through her hard work and effort, continued to push Highway 100, and today that road is being constructed thanks to Linda Langston. But let's not get overboard on this. We're not going to name the road after her for heaven's sake. Maybe a rest area or an exit, but certainly not the road. And you know, the more I think about it, when I wanted her support in 2009, I met her at the Brugger's and said, Hey, Linda, I'm running for mayor. I sure appreciate your support. And you know how she returned the favor? She said, Well, Ron, 
I'm thinking about running for mayor myself. Can you, can you believe it? Maybe if she had been more supportive of me in 2009, maybe we would have made this uh, road after her. What? what? What's that mean? Wrap it up. Okay, well, in conclusion, the impact that Linda Langston had on the construction of the Highway 100 project is just a part of her legacy, her dedication, and her passion, her intelligence. Linda, we will miss you. How's that? I could use a little more sincerity. Sincerity? Sincerity? Come on, I'm a Republican. She's a Democrat. I endorsed her. What more do you want? Plus, she's dead anyway. And you promised me a campaign contribution if I did this video. I received my campaign contribution. Where's my campaign contribution? You're not going to renege and not pay that campaign contribution, are you? You little dirty son of a... <laughs> Contribution never came through. Here, you big baby. I was going to talk about uh, resiliency or something like that. Uh, maybe that played a role in uh, the last couple weeks, but I guess this uh, hmm, this settles the score. We're going to miss you, Linda, but not that much. <laughs> As you can see, many have been affected by Linda's passing. And when there is a life lived so well and so large, the inevitable happened. Someone wrote a musical about it. <laughs> Linda's life story was made for the stage. The story of a little red-headed sprite whose can-do spirit and relentless optimism led her to a richer life and belief that there was always something better just about to happen. Unfortunately, a dispute over creative control led the original author to rewrite the play and recast the lead role to avoid legal dispute. But tonight we will, for the first time on any stage, perform the original version of this play about a plucky little orphan who believes a better life is only a day away, which come to be come to which which came to be known by a very different name. And do you know which play I'm talking about? Annie. Annie? Hell no. Not Annie. Who the hell looks at Linda Langston and thinks Annie? <laughs> Annie doesn't even have pupils. <laughs> no, the play I'm thinking of is, well, why not let him tell you? Ladies and gentlemen, Tony Award winning Writer and actor Lynn Manuel Miranda. Oh. <laughs> Annie, seriously. <laughs> it's true. It's true. The original draft of my musical Hamilton was written about Linda. <laughs> but the producers were afraid that her character might be too controversial and too divisive. I mean, have you ever met a politician more likely to die in a politically motivated duel than Linda Langston? <laughs> so we made some changes. I think you'll see that Linda and Alexander have a lot in common. It goes a little something like this. How does a crazy lady born on a farm in the itty bitty town of Mason City, a town whose punching citizens marinate in the stench of fertilizer, become Lynn County Supervisor? This is my fashion, compassion, suffragette traded tears, blood and sweat. 
her all that she could get. She appeared odd ballish, but she studied and she polished. At 18, she earned a scholarship to Knox College. The question on campus, does anyone know who this tramp is in young? David Langston thought he'd take his chance with this chick whose lips he'd been born to kiss, but first he had to learn her name. What's your name, Miss Little Linda Langston? My name is Little Linda Langston. There's a million things I haven't done But just you wait Just you wait Wed and fled Graduated Moved to Oklahoma Where they both tried hard to make lit Oklahoma is okay But Linda didn't fit So after six years She said, F this shit Cedar Rapids began to hit her stride Cause it was to collide With politicians' backsides A voice said, politics in your vein, she started speaking and greeting, and then she launched her first campaign. She said that Kevin is in desperate need of a slight made over. Luma, you should just concede her face a docile taking over. Starts freaking and tweaking, showing symptoms of angina. Who ever heard of an opponent with a brain and a vagina? elected you. You will never back down. You will never not speak your mind. Oh, little, little Langston, now you've done what you've set out to do. But if you thought that this campaign would be your last migraine, oh, Linda, have you met Joel Miller? <laughs> Testimonials from University of Iowa football coach Kirk Ferentz. Losing Linda is like losing to North Dakota State. It's unexpected and it hurts like hell, but in the end, I'm still going to be the highest paid public employee. In the state. And finally, from Satan. I heard Jesus gets a speaking role at your celebration of life. I'm hurt you didn't ask me. I hope Linda's not still holding a grudge for that time I tried to get her to switch parties. Don't blame me. I was just doing my job. And what better way to transition to our final testimonial of the evening? Here's a guy who needs no introduction. He's a rock star. Hell, he's a superstar. Ladies and gentlemen, fall on your knees and give it up for Jesus H. Christ. <laughs> I'm sure many of you have questions for me, as so many do when I make a public appearance. <laughs> Usually on a piece of toast. <laughs> oh. Oh, God. <laughs> so perhaps I will share my thoughts. Before I share my thoughts about Linda, I should just quickly dispense with a few frequently asked questions for convenience's sake. <laughs> It stands for Hiram, <laughs> my mother's favorite uncle on her, on her father's side. <laughs> it's a thinker. <laughs> yes, I did like the movie, some of the best work Tom Hanks did since Bosom Buddies and Bachelor Party, but Mary and I were just friends. <laughs> if not you, 
Then who, huh? Did you ever think about that? <laughs> okay, with the FAQs out of the way, <laughs> let's move on to the focus of our evening, Linda Langston. Now that Linda has passed on, I wanted to drop in and assure you that she is in a better place. She is, in fact, running the place. <laughs> I'd say Linda had been in heaven for a whole 15 minutes before Our Lady of Stitch Fix began making suggestions on how to improve the place. Do these effing robes only come in white? What's with all the effing harp music? Haven't you any? Haven't any of you people heard of any Linux or Coltrane? Hello. <laughs> Love the wine, but who does a lady have to F to get a margarita around? <laughs> oh. <laughs> the colorful language, our Linda. <laughs> we couldn't always get an amen, but she was always good for a shit. Yeah. <laughs> hands, they would become full of the Holy Spirit when she spoke. <laughs> Haven't seen anyone use their hands to talk this much since Helen Keller joined the choir. <laughs> <laughs> it's, like it's like watching Pastor Benny Hinn try to whip and nay-nay the devil out of Richard Simmons on a coat <laughs> bed. <laughs> 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 I told her that we had been doing just fine up Heaven's Way for the last few thousand years, and that most angels seemed quite pleased with the way I ran the place. Easy for you to say, Junior, Linda told me, but some of us don't have a dad who will just give us a job in the family business, so how about you scooch over and let somebody else have some shot? <laughs> I'm not proud. I have to admit that I am not above feelings of wrath and frustration. If it looks so easy, I told her, Let's see you do it. And I gave her five loaves and two fishes. And I told her to feed the multitude. Not a problem, Jay Krizzle. <laughs> How about you just have a seat and watch some TV? So she makes one phone call, and five minutes later, David shows up. And before Della Reese can sing the closing credits, he'd whipped up a lovely seafood canapé and tilapia bruschetta for 5000 <laughs> From there on, she pretty much took over. I mean, I'm man enough to admit that she has done some pretty decent work. I go so far as to say she's performed some miracles. For instance, she has the power of prophecy. Those of you who knew Linda for any amount of time know this. When you would start speaking, she had that uncanny ability to finish your sentences. <laughs> <laughs> Well, she would finish your sentences for her. <laughs> because it may not have been the sentence that you were going to say, but she's not going to hold that against you. <laughs> and Linda had the way of demanding obedience, of soothing the savage beasts, of taking those rupt places and making them smooth that would please even the most fire and brimstone preacher. Just her presence brought people in line. No, you don't believe me? Well, let's just say that when Linda Langston was around, Ted Kennedy never forgot to open the car door for a lady. <laughs> That's my favorite. <laughs> Start the car. <laughs> Took the weightiest, took on the weightiest theological pickle of our time, the crisis about which I have received more pleas and more prayers over the last century than any other issue. The existential shit creek many a true believer has found themselves up without paddle or even canoe for more than a century. But do you know what? She exercised the goat. She pulled Ricketts' head out of his ass. She shipped in Renteria and got Madden from Tampa Bay and won the Cubs a World Series. <laughs> oh, you don't know that yet, do you? <laughs>
game six, trust me. <laughs> and I took all of her success with Grace and Aplomb until I was having a little wine and crackers with Dad. <laughs> the other morning, and I spied his WWLLD bracelet. <laughs> under the sleeve of his robe, and I just knew it was either her or me. So I am going to appeal to Linda's higher power and Lazarus, this lady, back into your midst and get my right-hand seat back. The power of politics compels you! The power of politics compels you! with Dave and with Adam, I noted that I'm a pretty unfiltered politician. It was part of why I never chose to run for higher office. God bless Ron for what he's going to do. I hope he succeeds. That may not be an endorsement, but it's about as close as you're going to get. You know, um, occasionally, um, I have been accused of being a little bit too blunt, uh, and perhaps by saying what was on my mind, um, but I actually prefer the term telling the truth. When I was a supervisor, I had to be a little bit more diplomatic and tactful, so I'm no longer an elected official in Lynn County. Of course, I do spend a fair amount of time in D.C. now, and that is guaranteed to be a crazy place. But when you leave office, and I knew this before I left, you find out who your friends really are. Because when you're no longer in a place of power, there are a lot of people who don't care anymore. They don't call because you really can't do anything for them. But I will say this, there are a lot of people in this audience tonight that I am pleased to call my friends. I'm especially touched by the fact that Laura Durr and her family came back. Thank you. And one thing I always said about Ted Healy, he professed that he was a terrible fundraiser when we did the fundraising for the History Center on First Avenue. He told me, I can't do this. And then he fearlessly went out and asked everybody he knew to give money to this institution. I expect no less of you in our continuing effort. Ted! Yay! 
Um, so, but I will say this. In a world when apparently politics has gone completely mad, A, I will not make any profession about what is going to happen in November. But I will say that most, maybe not all, but most politicians are human beings. They're just like you. I don't know of very many that decide to run for office with any other intent in mind than to do something good for their community. But they actually believe they can make a difference. And I remember when Brad Hart and all of us were working post-flood, and Brad went to a city council meeting because a lot of us said we could not understand the fact that there were people that came to those meetings and pounded on a podium and talked for on average two hours to say how awful the city was and how awful council was. Susie's here too. She's seen it. Are you kidding me? I would say, what the F? <laughs> this is a tough job. And the people on council and at the Board of Supervisors have worked to make this an incredible community. And they will continue to do that because they believe in this community. So I am a politician who valued community. Some of you heard me speak about community more than you ever wanted to admit. And that happened even when the community made it difficult for me to value some of them. <laughs> <laughs> a politician is no better than the people she serves. We get the politics that we deserve. And I ask you, when did it become cool to not be smart? That I will never understand. How How really can people be that stupid? People who make a conscious choice not to know are amazingly fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> and here's another thing I want to get off my chest. During my tenure in supervisor, I was often asked to run for other offices, for state senate, for Congress, for other offices. And my response then and now is this. Why would I want to be a part of a body, half of whom I want to kill? <laughs> Face it, these are not bright people. And besides, as a county supervisor, to get something accomplished, I only ever had to convince two other people to get something done. Now, if you're in the Senate, I don't care if you're in the state Senate where you might have to convince 25 other people, or in D.C. where you'd have to convince, you know, 100. I like my odds better at the local <laughs> level. So I like local government. I like being able to affect change in the place where I live. The reason I never became a federal politician is because I loved my family and myself way too much. I put up with the demands of a campaign, but the hours and hours that people spend on the phone every day dialing for dollars to me is a definition of insane. And I would tell you that Jim Leach shared with me after he lost his election and said, Linda, the first time you run for office, people should give you a pass. But the second time you run for office, if they don't ask for that psychiatric evaluation, <laughs> they should really question you. So, um, and oftentimes I would say in that land, and many people here would know this, I've always been comfortable asking for a cause. I love the work that I do now in D.C. because I work for counties all across this nation. And I actually really do believe in county government. 
But the reason we're here tonight is for the History Center. And I do have a history with the History Center. And the stories that are in the collection of the History Center are the bedrock of this city and county. There are few things more important than understanding where we come from and who was here before us. We understand and appreciate what we have today by catching a glimpse of what life was like before. And when I hear life was better back then, are you kidding me? <laughs> oh my goodness! That is delusional. Put on the actual clothes sometime that a woman wore at the turn of the last century and tell me that life was better back then. <laughs> I have read the story, and I have actually worn the recreated dresses. The work of any institution has to be mission-based, and the mission of the History Center is 